Uh, what we're going to have a look at uh, in a moment is uh, document update and alignment um, of the documents uh, that have been put up. We've heard the term wrapper today, um, whatever term that's going to be used there. These are the documents that you need uh, to be able to become BIM Level 2 compliant or certainly understand them all and, and, and certainly put uh, a vast number of them in place within your organisation. Now Terry this morning mentioned that uh, all of those documents are there now, they're on the BSI website or you can get to them through a BSI uh, website. Um, it will require you to get to some of the CIC documents uh, as well, um, but they're, they're all there. So you can go, you know what uh, BIM Level 2 is now and all that documentation is available. We have a continuing requirement uh, to keep these documents up to date uh, to get rid of some of the ambiguities. Um, people, you'll be surprised, no, perhaps you won't be surprised, how many people love sending us emails to tell us what's wrong with the standards uh, rather than what's right with them. So we gather all this information up and from time to time uh, we will go through all of that documentation and carry out an alignment to make sure everything fits together uh, so that you don't have any ambiguity. Uh, because obviously for anybody implementing it, one of the problems you're going to have, please, heard enough problems out there this morning about people can't even agree on the file naming convention. You certainly don't want ambiguity in the data set so that people can start arguing about which is the right one and which is the wrong one. So that's what we're going to be talking about in a minute. Uh, Guy very kindly uh, gave me that uh, uh, <laughs> historic uh, view. I'll actually point out another historic view because uh, these are quite interesting to some degree, to some of us anyway, but I'm going to bore you with it. Um, we wouldn't be sitting here today if it hadn't been uh, for the work of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And you have... Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has somebody left a telephone here? Mm -hmm. Whoever it is, somebody's trying to call you. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Okay, good. Where was I? Uh, yeah, we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the work of quite a lot of people. Uh, Mark View, you've already heard about today. Uh, myself. Uh, but there's actually John Adams uh, sitting in the front of the uh, uh, auditorium here. He'll be speaking next, and it's interesting that uh, the two of us has been less left to the last uh, presentations. Uh, so John was with us uh, at Lang, a uh, great colleague and a very dear friend over the years, and I'm really pleased to see him here today. Uh, what I'm trying to do there is to say that there were quite a number of people that are involved in this activity. David Throssell is another one I will mention uh, at Skanska that actually did all this work during the 1990s and in the early 2000s. And for one reason or other then dispersed, and John obviously moved to the dark side, uh, but for the rest of us we moved out to try to help the industry uh, move forward. So, <laughs> you, you got there in the end, you got there in the end, it's all that matters. You are speaker John, okay. So what is this all about, document update? About BIM level two. Uh, once again, I'm using this to emphasise it's BIM Level 2, BIM Level 2, BIM Level 2, not Level 2, BIM, Level 2, BIM, or any other rearrangement of those three items that the industry is wonderful in and it has to keep reinventing things. So even that has to be uh, swapped around by lots of different people. So this is about BIM Level 2, not BIM Level 3. Uh, that is where we've got to get to eventually, but we cannot get to BIM Level 3 uh, until we've actually embedded uh, BIM Level 2. And it, what did come up in Terry's... Uh, thing this morning, I don't know whether you all noticed it, but part of the BIM Level 3 work that we have to do is to embed BIM Level 2. So the work hasn't finished, it will continue until we're satisfied it's in place and can support the activities that we will need to bring into play for BIM Level 3. Now on all these levels, 1, 2, 3, whatever, I uh, just wanted to just clarify something that uh, there was also a presentation this morning on the slide there which showed us as Level 5, 6, 7 and 8. They have got absolutely nothing to do with BIM Level 2. They are academic terms. They are levels of academic achievement, so to Level 5, Level 6, Level whatever. Uh, so don't let's get the two mixed up. There's not people out there doing Level 8. Um, I'd be very surprised how many are doing BIM Level 2. They are building and they are moving forward, but don't let's get confused about that and don't worry about it. For BIM Level 2, the April date is with us. It passed a couple of days ago. And the government departments will require, and once again, need to just put the emphasis here somewhere. Terry did this morning, I'm going to re-emphasise it now. It is the government departments that have to be ready to procure the requirement. We've set the date, 
to hopefully get you, uh, the industry, to also prepare yourself to answer uh, the requirements put down by those departments. So April the 4th was the capital projects for BIM Level 2 processes. The mandate is there. This is what you have to do. The documentation I've mentioned already has moved to the BSI website. I haven't got the link here with me today because, once again, I've seen three different versions of the link. So we'll take the one that was on Barrow on yours this morning, uh, rather than me confusing the issue now. Uh, and as we say, through that link, uh, BSI, uh, uh, which is the right place to put these documents because the BSI fundamentally wrote uh, most of them in the first place and they're the right people to keep this up, up to date and moving forward, as, and supported by the BS555 committee as well. Uh, I don't know whether you know there is a dedicated committee uh, at the BSI uh, called 555 which locks, uh, looks after all standards uh, for the construction industry and that is, there's a whole steering group, uh, a committee there uh, that really understands where we're going, hopefully they will all still understand where we're going and how we're going to get there. So it's the best place for that, uh, that to be. The other thing uh, about this is uh, to remember is that last bit there for all those people who worry about money, is that the documents are still free for at least the next two years, as I understand. Okay, so there's no need to worry about, I don't have to pay for that, I can't afford it, whatever. It is all there and it is all free to download. Having said that, there is one document, which you should have there, uh, which it says you have to pay for at the moment. Don't download it. It's actually BS 1192 review plus two. Um, so don't download it at the moment because it says on the website plus one. Uh, so wait a couple of weeks and that one will be free as well. Keep visiting it uh, and keep updating yourself as we move forward. There is always this updating process going on. Part of the problem here is that a lot of these documents, some of them, BS 1192-207 has been in place obviously since 2007. So we're, we've moved on quite considerably. Uh, that document has been hammered to death. Uh, we've had everybody and, and his dog um, sending in uh, things saying, you know, we spelt such and such wrong on the third line and whatever. Interestingly enough, we haven't had anybody saying it's wrong. Yeah. So it has stood the test of time. The one thing in there that everybody does talk about, of course, is the file naming convention, which, of course, is completely wrong for everybody. And if, if you understood, and I'm going to tell you so that you do understand, the amount of energy we put into coming up with that file naming convention was based around 70 odd organisations, 70, 70 odd organisations in, in 2005, 2006, uh, prof proffering their CAD systems and their drawing management systems. And to get 70 people to agree on that file naming convention that we've got there, believe me, took a heck of a lot of effort. But we came to a conclusion, we came to an agreement, it was tested over a 10 year period, and it was again tested with government money through what was known as the Avanti program. It does work. Uh, I think it was the Olympics argued about what the file naming convention should be for almost six years, uh, and never came to a conclusion. Uh, so, you know, it's there, we know it works, use it, don't try to uh, overthink it. Okay, so that is being brought up to date. Uh, there are some small changes there, which means we then have to align all of the other documents that may refer back to that. Uh, and indeed, even documents that don't refer back, we've also had to look at. So we, we are now going through this alignment process, which is not a simple one in itself. The main documents that we're looking at at the moment are BS 1192-207. Uh, there is a Corrie Agendum plus two, which is the one I was just talking about. On the BSI website at the moment, they're still at A1. So there is another one. Well, it should have been up there last week, but um, obviously they haven't quite got through their, their own internal processes to get it there. Keep looking at the website. That one is coming up. It says you pay for it now, but it should be free. Uh, it's only a Corrie Agendum after all. We're also looking at PAS 2 and we're looking at PAS 3. And alongside that, we also have to check against the CIC BIM protocol. The BIM protocol, all of you have read it, I'm taking it. Well done. That's, that's quite good, uh, at least half there. <laughs> One late hand. 
Um, the CIC document, the, the protocol, lays down how we're supposed to be working, what are the responsibilities of the client, and what's the responsibility of, of the supply chain. Uh, and there are one or two things in there that uh, have got out of step, particularly what was in BS 1192 and indeed in PAS 2. So we've had to look at the CIC BIM protocol as well. Not sure whether that one will be updated. That's still in the throes of it. Basically, the BIM protocol is in the annexes. Uh, they are, to some degree, uh, uh, in conflict with PAS 2, certainly on levels of graphical representation uh, and levels of information. So go to PAS 2 for that bit, or, in fact, you should be going to the DPOW uh, on the MBS website. How many of you have visited that? Okay, because that becomes a very uh, important place to go to. It's not just for the client. It is going to be for anybody who is the main contractor producing their own DPOWs for, uh, uh, for bringing together their own supply chains as well. So you need to know how to write an EIR, let alone use one. Okay, uh, so the, BAS, uh, the other thing we've been looking at is in the PAS 2 processes, which is this uh, lovely diagram, which now seems to have uh, acquired a name. It's either called the racetrack or the monopoly ball, depending on where you go. Um, it is interesting, and I was interested in seeing some of the slides that Tim put up just now, where everybody tries to draw a diagram that goes clockwise. And so the Germans, who have now decided they're going to go this way, have now written their own racetrack. It is in blue, which is quite interesting, but it is a circle instead of this uh, monopoly board shape. And they, they've tried to write it anti -clockwise, going clockwise rather than anti-clockwise. Well, the reason why you can't go anti-clockwise, in this you have to go, sorry, you have to go anti-clockwise, is because of these numbers here. They read from the left to the right, which is the more logical way to do it, so the procurement activity wraps around them. Now, the common data environment, by the way, goes the same way. Work in progress, shared, etc. Um, and that was for a reason which I won't go into at the moment. So this is the process that we're looking at, PAS 1192 Part 2 uh, processes. Now, does everybody really understand what all of that means? We put as much as we can in the PAS, but the PAS is actually limited by the number of pages. Now, all of these documents, uh, BSI documents, are limited by the number of pages. So you can't actually give too much guidance. You, you run out of space very quickly. But what we have done in trying to make sure this works and it's fully understood is we've produced uh, a number of process maps, more detailed process maps, of each one of the stages in that blue path. So there's one at zero, one, two, three, three, and then at six again. And they look like this for the moment. The procurement activity is at the top there. And the bottom part here is in operation, the common data environment, how you share information, and then how you deliver it, what checks you need to make. Validation and verification are very much part of this whole process. Just to clear that up, our term of verification is we can verify. I asked you a question. Did you answer it? Yes, you did. I don't know whether that answer is right, because we need some other acceptance criteria to validate that the question is actually right. So we can verify you've delivered it but then we have to validate whether it was the right answer. Now, everybody expects that process to be at the far end after gate six, stage six. In fact, it has to happen all the way along the development route, so you know whether you've got this information right or not. You don't want to get to gate six and find out it was wrong, because that may mean you're going back and redesigning something and putting it right. Who knows? So verification and validation is something we're also talking about in this process, and where does it occur? So you can't read this uh, very well. We have updated it since I put it in this presentation. Okay, uh, but the red points are where we have got to produce some visual examples of what these things look like. So that's what the red writing there uh, actually, actually means. Once these have been tested, and they are being tested on a number of major projects at the moment, government projects, uh, to see whether they work or have worked, or it is uh, the way in which we would like to change those processes to adapt and adopt, then we will be uh, completing these and they will be available on the BSI website. Uh, there will be a, um, uh, an area where we've got all these process maps showing guidance. So there will be a lot of written information at each one of these stages to expand on, on PAS 2. 
So the CIC uh, protocol is, is uh, describing the responsibilities of the client employer, the responsibilities of the contractor employer, and the responsibilities of the lead design construction contractor. I put this one up because we keep running into problems here. We use the word contractor, contractor, contractor. This is anybody that bids for work and wins work. So we have contractor designers, possibly, in the procurement route. People get confused about who is the client and the employer. So we've got that one there that says uh, client employer, contractor employer, and it could in fact be that you've got lead design has a contract and the constructor or construction can also be a contra cons contractor. So even, even presenting it, it's a, it's a bit awkward to do. So we must understand when you're reading these documents what contractor means. Do not think it's just the construction company. We're all contractors. We're contracted to carry out a design activity. We have our supply chain. We are contracted to deliver information. The constructor is then delivered to uh, produce and deliver the project with that information embedded in it. Or, sorry, I better not say that because that's the one thing I don't want. I don't want it embedded in the model. I do want it as part of the information model, which is 3D, non-graphical information, documents and drawings. So these are just one or two items for clarification. The other one that we get uh, problems with, and please shout if this is true, MPDT. Does everybody know what that is? One hand went up there. Oh, two, three. <laughs> okay, there's been a, been a problem with this thing, the model production and delivery template, or table, doesn't matter which one you call it, MPDT. This is actually a contractual document. So, and also, it is uh, in the first part of the EIR, uh, is the client's first attempt to specify at a high level who does what information at what time through those stages. So when is the architect involved? Where, when, when is the town planning involved, etc., etc. That is a high level explanation. That goes to the supply chain who will then the main contractor will look at that, assess the need, and then put together his supply chain to answer those particular high-level requirements. They then develop their task information delivery plans, what it is they're going to develop, and the main contractor will pull those all together as to what models are actually going to be developed to answer the questions that the client has asked. And those models will be extracted into the MPDT as part of the contractual commitment for delivery at gate six. That didn't clear up anything, did it? I can see by the look on your faces. Now, but I've raised it and we've put some more explanation in there as to what that's all about. <coughs> and as it says, this document forms part of the contract and will contain the graphical models and the non-graphical information to be delivered during the CAPEX delivery. I will hasten to add here um, if I haven't done it later on, that um, this problem about delivering the aim, the asset information model, you don't deliver an asset information model, you produce the project information model with everything in it and you hand it over to the client, who will validate that the answers they've got, and that will have to be done manually to a large extent, uh, forms a, a data set that can be used for asset management. So the PIM is still there, and this question that uh, Terry put up, or somebody put up, Tim put up just now, is how do we keep the virtual model up to date during this process? Uh, well, the way we do that is that the data set, the models, the 3D models, etc., are in a common data environment in the client's ownership. And his asset management CAFM systems feed off that data. They don't change it. The change comes about by other small programs, large programs, or whatever. So back around the racetrack, procuring an activity, bringing about change, update the, the data in the, in the PIM. So the other thing that needs to be defined are the deliverables at each stage. Initially, as I said, they will be uh, defined by the client in the DPOW, uh, along with the uh, required LODs. And once again, I split this down, as we keep trying to do, into graphical representation and the information that needs to be delivered at each of those stages. Now, one of the problems with the protocol is it said that there were seven stages of LOD. And no, there aren't. Uh, there are seven stages, uh, but you don't keep increasing uh, the graphical representation in particular as you move through. Uh, there are three at the most. Uh, and so we'll have to look at, uh, and I think if you look at the DPOW, um, that is actually quite limited 
Uh, fortunately, I think it goes to four stages. But in general, there's only three levels of graphical representation, so don't let's run away with the idea there's seven. You'll be there forever, building your latest uh, interview model. Uh, the, main, the main and important thing that we are, we are actually procuring through this activity is the information. And so the DPOW from the client asks the question, and you need to answer that question how you're going to ask for it, which means you have to break that down uh, from the main contractor and produce another EIR to procure your supply chain. What do I want you to produce for me so when I wrap it all up together, I can answer the client's uh, original requirement. Uh, the DPOW will continue to be developed. The, uh, the initial one is out there. Uh, people are using it, uh, and there are things that we need to tweak and update or whatever as we move through. So these things are always in a state of continuous uh, update. The more and more we learn, we're all learning together. So PAS 2 has been updated and a number of ambiguities removed. Additional guidance and notes have been added. All documents have been reviewed for consistency in terms of terms and definitions. And, and the, TR, the TMDs are also part of an ISO BIM review that we're carrying out. I don't know whether how many of you know, but we're actually moving the PAS and the BSs to ISO 19650. Uh, so this is hopefully to deliver this. Hopefully we will be delivering an international version. And in that situation, we've had to make sure that the terms and definitions are consistent across all of the documents so that they will be consistent in the ISO standards as they come round the piece. So we pulled all of those out, all of the different CNDs out of all of the documents, put them into one big document, gone down and agreed which ones actually comply, which ones don't, what is the consistent one, and then we've sent it to the ISO team. They're also carrying out the same thing now uh, as we speak, and hopefully we get that back in a couple of weeks. We can then put the TNDs consistently throughout all of the documents. For instance, if anybody's looks at it, does anybody know what a TBM is? Sorry? You read the standard. What does it really mean? <laughs> exactly. Uh, the reason that came about was originally it was TBM as temporary benchmark in smaller, and then somebody elevated it to uppercase, and I won't go into it. Unfortunately, steering committees, when you're writing standards, can hold sway over the authors. So the authors really need to grab hold of these things and make sure that they, are, they really understand what they're talking about uh, and push it through. Uh, and I go back to the 70 people in a room trying to figure out what a file name is. So we've also added some further aids to uh, understanding of an EIR and what uh, they shall contain. Uh, it wasn't until we got to PAS 3 that we realised it wasn't just the EIR that should have been there, which was basically standards, methods and procedures. The ER still remains, so the employer's requirement is still there. The I is just, and we want to procure this, the return of this in a digital form. But we also have the requirements for the organisational information requirements and the AIRs, the asset information requirements, which will aid the information we deliver, the CAFM. And into that, of course, now that it's been written and published, is the security requirement. So the EIR will not just be standards, methods and procedures, as on the task group website. It actually has to take into account these other requirements as well, right at the beginning of the project. So you have to understand how you're going to answer those sorts of questions as well. Okay. Uh, there's also further commentary to the requirements to verify and validate. I mentioned earlier information continuously throughout the delivery stages. Somebody mentioned just now that some projects, are, I think it was him, in 35 years to deliver. Well, you don't start maintenance when you finish the project. You're doing maintenance from almost as you hand over. Uh, bits of it. So all of this stuff must be available to the, uh, into the information management role very early on in the project. Certainly at Terminal 5 we used to change the, the uh, coil fans uh, quite regularly as we were dragging dust up out of the lower basement levels at Terminal 5 and we were into maintenance for almost three or four years before we handed over. The verification and validation also is continuous across the gate, that's gate 6, at the end of stage 6 uh, into final delivery and the post-occupancy evaluation. One other thing here is that people come up with, well, the post-occupancy evaluation period could be 25 years. Well, we're not going to wait until we finish that, even though the diagram may say it. So we've got to get this information in place and start maintaining it from day one. What the occupational period is going to do is, is the building performing against the original brief consistently over the, over the period of that evaluation? It should be noted that acceptance of completed information is defined by the evolved brief. 
So GSL talks about the brief, which is at stage one. Really, the thing we're going to be checking against is the evolved brief, which really comes out of the design uh, intent model at the end of stage three. Yep. So just an update on that to understand what that diagram's really, really trying to say. Uh, and so it's that, that uh, that will be at the end of stage three, and that will, be, will form the basis of the requirement of 8536, the soft landings requirement, to be there at the end of the job, look at, see what's going on, desnag it, etc., and deliver against that evolved brief. And I think that's about as far as I would like to go at the moment. I think we've uh, come to an end there, as this page shows you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I hope that helped. <laughs>